<clears throat> so good evening, everyone. For the inaugural year, the OAA selected a theme that affects everyone, infrastructure. Submissions to the SHIFT program focused on how architects use their skills, design thinking, problem solving, and knowledge of the built form to propose new ways to understand, create, or support physical or social infrastructure that links our communities. I would like to thank the 2019 SHIFT Challenge Jury members, Ilana Altman, Terence Galvin, <clears throat> Ken Greenberg, Jana Levitt, and Raymond Moriyama for their insight and diligence in reviewing the more than 40 entries we received. These submissions range from intimate local projects that could be replicated in communities across the province to massive transformations, altering how various components of the build environment interact with each other. Our jury evaluated projects on a number of criteria, including innovation, social responsibility, inspiration, and inclusivity. Ultimately, seven projects were selected and four honorable mentions were identified. These specific projects will be celebrated this evening as well, uh, as can be seen on the OAA blog, the shiftchallenge.ca website, and in the 2019 Shift publication. Representatives from the seven selected project teams will present their innovative ideas. <laughs> Any one of these projects, if implemented, would help address an issue of immense importance. However, however, when thought of holistically, they complement and reinforce each other. I hope the diversity, expertise, and ingenuity of Ontario architects reflected in tonight's presentations inspire you just as they have inspired me. It's our hope they will also inspire the public, showing how the architecture profession goes beyond traditional buildings and can contribute important ideas in new conversations. I would now like to introduce our moderator for this evening, Robin Mazumder. Robin is a Vanier Scholar and a doctoral candidate in cognitive neuroscience at the University of Waterloo, where he is studying the psychological impacts of urban design. His research is inspired by his passion for urbanism, his frontline experience working as an occupational therapist in mental health, and his interest in human-centered design. Some of you may recall that he helped us kick off a shift at uh, last year's OA conference in Toronto, and we are absolutely thrilled to have him back. Please join me in welcoming Robin. Hey, thank you. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Amir, and uh, thanks, Katie, uh, for your introductions. Um, I actually had a chance to speak to Katie last night um, at dinner, and uh, I was like blown away by her passion for architecture, but also for advocating uh, for it in Canada. So, um, so I think you're all very lucky to have her as a leader. Um, so it's nice to be back. Um, some of you might remember me from the AGM. I'm much more dressed up tonight. Um, <laughs> I thought a blue Oxford shirt and some jeans and some kind of cool shoes would do it. And when I looked out in the crowd at the AGM, I saw a bunch of really cool glasses, bow ties, and nice dresses and suits. And so I thought I just had to step it up. And, I saw Tone Dreesen tweet about his collection of Fluvogs that he was bringing with him, so I was like, I cannot. <laughs> Black suit, I might be overdressed, but I definitely won't be underdressed, hopefully. <laughs> um, so, uh, will this just start? Cool. So before um, I introduce the amazing uh, selected projects here, um, I thought I'd share a bit about uh, myself and my perspective on what Shift is all about. And um, I was going to start by just talking a bit about like, how I spent five years of my life and how that shaped my understanding of architecture. And I spent five years working as an occupational therapist in community mental health. And occupational therapy is a pretty poorly understood profession. So here's a, like, a really quick history lesson on occupational therapy. So occupational therapy came about in like, the early 1900s um, when a group of people came together and realized that they all had something to contribute. Um, and they wanted to create a healthcare profession that took a bit of each of what they did. So there was a social worker, um, there was a teacher, uh, there was a doctor, and I think most interesting, interestingly, there was an architect. And it was the architect that really brought this group together and wanted to create a profession that was really um, addressing how the environment or the built environment uh, impacted uh, well-being. Um, so during my occupational therapy training, um, you know, we got we got a lot of 
theory uh, in school and, and models. And one of the models that um, I became acquainted with was the medical model of disability. And so medical, the medical model of disability really locates illness and disability in the person. And so the person is kind of seen as the problem. Um, they're seen as defective. Um, they're the ones that need to be cured. Um, but when I was in OT school, we actually focused more on the social model of disability. And what I love about the social model of disability is it focuses more on the environment. So disability or illness is seen as a product of a disabling environment um, and people uh, facing barriers within that environment. And that environment can be social, it can be the physical environment, the built environment, it can be the cultural environments. And using that kind of perspective, um, I went out to work in the world. So it shifted my understanding and, or my perspective on disability from seeing people as disabled to seeing environments as disabling. Um, just one more model, because I think this crowd might find it interesting. Um, we learned about this model called the PEO model, or the Person Environment Occupation Model. And that really is about um, someone's ability to perform an activity or what occupational therapists call occupations. Um, that performance of that occupation or that activity is a, is a means to health. And your ability to do that is actually based on the fit between who you are as a person, um, the thing that you're doing, but I think most importantly, um, the environment. And there are some assumptions that come with the model and so that people are always changing. So disability is, is, a, is a complex experience or illness is a complex experience and people are constantly changing. Um, that we can change or influence the environment and the environment can influence us. Um, that it can enable or disable. Um, but I think most importantly that it's often easier to change than the person. And in five years of cl clinical work, I can tell you that people are hard to change, but you can make a lot of changes to the environment which can actually help them even more. So using that framework, I went out to you know, work in the community. Um, and I started thinking about enabling and disabling environments. And I got my first job at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health um, in downtown Toronto. And I worked on a schizophrenia inpatient unit. So my job was really to help um, transition people, um, very ill psych people in the midst of psychosis um, and getting stabilized, taking them from environments like this um, and then helping them live in environments like this. And throughout the whole process, I was reflecting on that environmental perspective from the interior design of, I mean, it's not that depressing, but it's not any place that I think you'd want to spend too much time. So, you know, the design of the healthcare facility to even the city and how that really shaped how people felt and functioned. And I started really um, spending a lot of time just thinking about that. And I also worked on, an, on a community mental health team um, in Edmonton. And on that team, I worked with people with intellectual disabilities, um, uh, physical disabilities, and mental health issues. And regardless of like the long laundry list of, of diagnoses that these people experience, had, the most detrimental thing that I came across that every, pretty much every single person that I worked with um, faced was loneliness. And the majority of these people lived in boarding homes on the outskirts of the city. Um, they're all kind of five or six people crammed into one of these homes. They were all living on income assistance and so they didn't have the means to live more central. And there was one particular person that I worked with um, and he had uh, attempted suicide and uh, I was, you know, I was like, what brought you to that point? And he's like, I just don't have any friends. I'm super, super lonely. And so I was like, okay, well, let's go for a walk in your community and see where we can meet people. And it kind of looked like something like this. All of the houses looked the same. There wasn't a lot of visual complexity or beauty to even maybe lift his moods a bit. Um, and there weren't any spaces to connect with people. And so I had this kind of personal uh, professional crisis where I was like, I don't think I'm actually doing anything. I don't think that we can medicate loneliness, that we actually have to do something about the built environment. And so I quit my job um, and I returned to school to do my PhD in cognitive neuroscience where I'm trying to use methods to understand how it is that our physical environment, um, built environment of a city, affects the way that we feel and function. So um, in my research, um, I stick people in virtual reality um, and expose them to different um, urban landscapes. So we use 360 video to get something very real realistic. Um, and we also use um, uh, animate or mock-ups. And uh, we take their blood pressure, 
Uh, there's skin conductance, which is that picture you see in the middle there, which is um, a measure of your emotional sweat, which is an indicator of your stress. And then we'll also look at heart rate variability. So what I'm trying to do in the lab is to quantify the qualitative aspects that many people in this room just know intuitively about so that we can make some evidence-based um, decisions and also just like give the data to the people with the money so that we can say these sorts of things or these interventions or these design approaches actually lead to better well-being. So this is an example of um, one of the environments. Um, it looks pretty bad here, but if you've got the helmet on, it's pretty realistic. And in this uh, circumstance, we're interested in looking at how being surrounded by looming oppressive buildings affects the way that you feel. Projecting 100 years in the future, there's some sort of dystopian city landscape where all you have are all these really tall buildings. So I'm trying to get ahead of that a bit. Um, we also do uh, research in the community. So this was in Vancouver in 2016. Um, and we used wearable technology um, and phones. So these are, I mean, if you saw this today, it just looked normal with people just staring at their phones. But I think we were doing this right around before it got really bad. But, <laughs> and I think it's getting worse. But, um, so we take, took people on a walk of, of downtown Vancouver and, had, and measured their psychological responses to places like this. And we really wanted to focus on really simple urban interventions like paint, like how does paint um, add to, someone's experience, um, and we looked at you know, places that weren't that, that nice. And what we found was that really simple things that we do in our communities, like, um, like the Rainbow Crosswalk, like I mentioned, um, greenscape land, uh, back alleys, or community gardens can add a statistically significant effect to someone's well-being. Um, so I'm gonna keep this really short because you're not here to see me, you're here to see these people. Um, but I just want to leave you with one kind of thought. You all probably know this, but I really believe that architecture is a determinant of health um, and equity and dignity and so much more. And we'll hear more about these different elements of architecture um, from the selected projects from the shift. So I'll